Welcome to the Rex Andrews Show. For those who found us for the first time, welcome to the conversation. Glad to have you. Glad you tripped over us. And for our returning listeners, thank you, thank you. We just got news last week. Because of your listening, we are now in the top 10% of all new podcasts growing. So that's pretty exciting news, considering that there's over a million podcasters walking the earth today. A couple of housecleaning items, please subscribe, regardless on what platform you're on. We're on social media, everywhere you can find. And then we are on 23 different app um, apps for uh, podcasts. So wherever you listen, we should be there. And then you can always find us on my website at rexandrewshow.com. Well, I'm excited today. I don't know what this is. We've had a few recordings today, all in the travel industry. So we're going to continue our travel theme for today. So listen to the other episodes on the front and back side of this. And I have a great guest. And I think anybody with a family will appreciate that. And heck, you don't have to be a family. You could be an empty nest or seniors. You could be just, you know, starting out. But my guest here today is Kelly Nielsen, and she is an expert on how to travel on the cheap. And I don't know if that's the best way to say it, Kelly, but uh, welcome, glad to have you. Well, thanks for having me. And it's funny you say travel on the cheap. I used to say that a lot more and I realized I got people saying, I'm too old to stay in hostels. <laughs> <laughs> I changed it now, it's travel on your budget. Whatever your budget is, you can have a dream vacation. Well, that's a good way to put it. Cause yeah, I hadn't thought about that travel on cheap if I'm, if I'm a 70 year old guy, I don't know if I want to be sleeping in a tent somewhere, right? I don't either. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not up for backpacking across Europe. No, sorry. So anyway, well, let's, um, let's dial this in for our listeners today. I'd like you to tell us your story. Uh, you know, where did you grow up and tell us about your family and tell us how Kelly hopped from one rock to one rock across the stream. You know, life is like a crossing a stream. You hop onto one rock and you hope you never go back to other rocks, but you always cross the stream and you end up in your diff your destination. So tell us a little bit about your journey here, Kelly. Oh, absolutely. Well, well started, I grew up here in Denver, Colorado, and I grew up in a big family. So one of six. And uh, my dad was a teacher, high school teacher, and my mom was a stay at home mom. Both of them love the idea of traveling with their family across the world. I think a lot of parents have that dream of exposing their kids to other cultures and doing all these fun adventures. Um, but with that many kids and that kind of income, budgets were really, really tight. And my mom um, was very good at pinching pennies and making things work, but the travel seemed like something that wouldn't really happen. So we went on some great family road trips, some great national parks, what we could do at the time, until my mom figured out how to kind of crack the travel hacking code. And once she figured that out, Suddenly, uh, I would say when I was in high school, a little bit younger than high school, we started traveling all over the world. We started staying in five-star resorts for cheaper than you would stay at your local Best Western. With our whole family, grandma and grandpa came along and had these really amazing adventures. And now fast forwarding a handful or so years later, I have my own little family that's growing and we're traveling all over the world together, going on pretty spectacular vacations that most people think are completely out of reach but we do it with newborn babies and toddlers and, and uh, sometimes even make money. Wow, this is going to be a fun, fun episode. So, I mean, who wouldn't want to travel um, for a lot less than, than expected? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna have to tell you, um, Kelly, you might've dated yourself staying in a Best Western. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know what it is now. We don't stay at those hotels anymore. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you know, Best Western, that can't be top of the rock, you know. So, <laughs> maybe I would have thought you would have said Crown Plaza or something. So, anyway. <laughs> All right. So let's dive in. Let's unpack here a little bit. Um, what was uh, cracking the hack? What was basically figuring out how to do this um, for significant less than if you were paying full price? There's a few different factors involved. I think one of the biggest things when it comes to travel is we all have this kind of vacation bias. So we think of where we're at in life, where we live, we compare ourselves to the people around us that we assume have similar families, similar incomes, um, similar lifestyles. And the kind of vacations we see them going on, we assume that's the kind of vacation I can go on. 
And uh, so we kind of lock ourselves into this bubble of what we can afford because this is the way you travel. And it wasn't until we started looking at things differently and realizing there's different routes to go, different ways to book travel, different ways to experience travel um, that can make it so much cheaper and can make you have these vacations that really feel like they are for someone else that's either further on in life, you know, there's retired people that saved up their time doing it, or it's people that make a lot more money than you make, but those trips are completely within reach with the right help. So what, what specifically are you doing? Are you uh, booking em empty inventory? I mean, you know, I know that you, you help people one-on-one -on -one with this, but I want to understand from a general perspective, what are the, some of the general strategies that you're doing that, because, uh, you know, the, the big, there's two biggest components of travel in my understanding mm -hmm. is your, your transportation. So airfare, what have you, and then your lodging. You know, those are the two biggest expenses, yeah. food, food, you know, and then anybody can control a um, expenditure budget. Well, what trinkets are you buying? T-shirts and hats and yada, yada, yada. OK, mm -hmm. so what in general are you working on that makes it so you can afford those deals that you can, you know, do this? So what you hit on is actually very key. It's instead of worrying about the $10 and hundred dollars here and there, it's what can I focus on to save the most amount of money without spending all my time chasing down the little bits of saving that would, I think, impede a lot of people from looking for deals because I think of all the time it will take. Mm -hmm. So airfare is huge. So for example, uh, we've been able, minus this past year, of course, to go to Europe about every six months. Wow. Which is pretty incredible considering, <laughs> you know, we're not necessarily in a super high income bracket, um, but we have a European vacation about twice a year. Wow. Um, we'll take our little toddler with us. And one of the tricks is instead of spending about $2,000 plus per ticket to get to Europe, we usually spend about $500. Wow, round. that's great. Mm -hmm. And there's ways you can do that. On my blog, I have a, a great link um, that I'll link a whole list of resources for your listeners. But it's about using flight finder websites is one of the, the travel hacks that I use. So instead of you constantly searching, trying to find that flight deal that may or may not pop up, that may or may not be in the time frame and the location you want to be going to, it's about having those deals sent to you automatically. And that way, when you see a vacation that's, oh, I would love to go to Rome or to Thailand, you can just book it right through, the deal's already found for you, and you don't have to do all the searching. It does all the searching for you. Wow, that's great. Because am I hearing you that you're gonna need a little bit of flexibility to do this? Flexibility is key. I think uh, obviously the more flexible you are in your vacation, the more you can save, the more potential there is to save. Okay. So for example, if you say, my family, we wanna go to Hawaii for Christmas this year, with these specific times, then your opportunity for save that may or may not come up, not impossible. We definitely find those kinds of deals all the time, but to get your best maximum saving, it would be best to say this winter, we want to go to the beach. Okay. And if we want to go to the beach this winter, then if that deal shows up to Thailand, which may be cheaper than Hawaii, or if it shows up to um, South America, or if it shows up to the Bahamas, we'll be willing to take any of those vacations and we can save much, much more than when we're being highly specific. Okay. Well, that would make sense because maybe in Thailand, they're not celebrating Christmas like they would be celebrating Christmas break in Honolulu or mm -hmm. Maui or something. Okay. That's neat. Um, so then let's now skip over to lodging. I mean, is it the same type of thing or is there, what's the technique that you look for in lodging? Lodging is a really cool industry right now because it is opening up so much more than it ever has. Traditionally, you know, back when we, I was traveling as a kid or, or even, you know, as a younger adult, there was a hotels, mm -hmm. you know, you could choose a hotel or you could choose a resort. Right. And so you could pay a lot for the resort or you could pay less for the hotel, have less amenities. And that was really your only choices for lodging as far as that went, unless you're one of those people that it's going to backpack or, you know, do a hostel or something like that, which a lot of people, you know, we have, a, we travel with little kids. So hostel just isn't a great option for us. No, that's not happening. Not happening. And so what's amazing is in past, really in the past few handful of years, 
lodging has opened up with the event of things like um, Airbnb, VRBO, where mm -hmm. people are opening homes and actually making locations for travelers to come to that are really customized experience and at a really great price. One of my favorite hacks for lodging that people don't think about a lot is sometimes thinking expensive can actually be cheaper in the long run. Okay. So for example, if you are traveling with a family or a larger group, you may be prone to booking several small hotel rooms. So like you said, the crown plaza, we right. might get three crown plaza rooms um, for our vacation to fit everybody in. We'll get the cheapest rate we can to get everybody in. But if you actually look at getting that penthouse suite, it may be cheaper in the long run to get the one penthouse suite, have everybody split the cost of that together mm -hmm. and you have a much nicer vacation, nicer lodging, and then you don't have to pay for food every single time because you have a kitchen to make food in too. Right, <clears throat> right. You know, we, uh, my family experienced that a, couple, a few years back. We went on a uh, trip with um, two families, okay? And we decided to go ahead and get an Airbnb outside of Disneyland. And it was really outside of Disneyland. Yeah. But <laughs> I guess close is a matter of per uh, perception, but we got it. And it really worked out from an economics perspective. That listing was through an Airbnb. It was nice. We did have a kitchen, even though it wasn't completely finished. And we did, I won't go off on this location. I mean, I've had a lot of great expense experiences yeah. <laughs> on Airbnb, but this wasn't one of those Airbnb experiences that was wonderful. But it did help because we were able to go get, you know, take out pizza and bring it back and, you know, all kinds of things like that. So it, it did help because I mean, you couldn't do that with the total people in the party were four were 14 people between the, the two families. Big so um, it was a great, great experience. It would have been a better experience if the, the location <clears throat> was closer to Disneyland, like we had hoped, um, and it was a better maintained property. But from the overall economics, it's, you know, it's a grin and bear it, look back, you know, fun, fun uh, We'll do experience. it differently next time. Yeah, we'll do it ne differently yeah. next time type thing. But that would have cost us easily three times more in hotels that were closer to the theme park. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, I'm sure that, that there, and then possibly too, I know some, some folks who have some Airbnb properties and they'll do fairly drastic discounts just to keep them full um, when traffic isn't that great for them. They will. And you'd be surprised how often, and this is something we could talk more about the airline side too, how you can hack airline flights and get free flights and, and right. uh, get better flights. But you'd be surprised how often when you reach out to those Airbnb people saying, hey, look, we will do, if you're willing, some more cleaning of the house. We're very responsible people. Um, we're not going to bring pets in if that were the case, if you're not traveling with kids to bring that up. Anything that would be beneficial to their property. Um, we promise to leave you reviews in these places. What kind of discount can you give us? And okay. sometimes just the asking, hey, what kind of discount can you give us? We'd like to go with your place versus place B. They will give you a good discount. And yeah. that's actually happened. We've gotten cleaning fees just knocked off before and, and not in a uh, trying to get more out of the situation kind of way, but just asking in a, in a friendly way saying, Hey, could you give us a discount? Then you'd be surprised how often they do. Well, you know, those, those people in most cases are very small operators. They might have one, sometimes two. I've met a person um, through construction business that had six of them, but regardless, you're talking to a small entity. You're not talking to Marriott. Okay. Who's, yeah. who's, who's not going to budge on, on price, okay? And if, if you're traveling in off season and there was not gonna be anybody in there in the first place, most of them are gonna to wanting to take something for their room rather than nothing. Absolutely. So, yeah, I agree. I would agree with you and I would think it would be expected behavior. So, you know, if you are a uh, thrifty and budget wise traveler, you know, if you, and you plan to use the Airbnbs types, you know, ask those owners. Absolutely ask them. Mm -hmm. Okay. You'd be surprised. Now, how about rental cars Did uh, and ground transportation? What have you kind of uncovered for that angle of the industry? Well, there's a few different things that are going on. Obviously, depending on where you're going, the type of ground transportation you use will vary drastically. So if you're going to a large metropolitan city, especially somewhere in Europe, they're going to have a really good public transit system. Right. And one of the best ways to think about public mm -hmm. 
transit or any sort of transit once you get to your destination is do as the locals do. And that is a really good secret for a lot of traffic or a lot of travel um, with a lot of different categories of travel. But if you can travel on the ground as the locals do, you'll save a lot more money. Usually the system is built to be the most efficient that way because that's what the locals are all doing. Um, And you'll have more of an authentic experience. That's so really good. things like taxis, taxis are very expensive versus taking the Metro. You're going to mm-hmm. save a lot more money. You're going to have kind of a cool experience too. Well, I, yeah, I can remember I was on a business trip and um, at that time, and this was gosh, 22 years ago, I went to London for the company I was working with. And most of the Americans were like, well, let's rent cars. Well, I had done a little bit of research and I'm going to ask about that in a moment. And we just got around by the two because it was so much more efficient. We rented a car one day and that was to go out to Stonehenge. And yeah. that was it. And that was the only time that we, got, because I think even back then, a liter of gas was like six or eight bucks a liter, yeah. something like that. It was crazy. And so it was so much more economical just to jump on the tube. It was a, a authentic experience. Mm-hmm. Um, funny memories from, from doing that. So and that can be a little you know, nerve wracking for some people too, if they're not used to public transit. Right. So how do you find out how effective their public transportation system is? I, I'll, I'll give you a short, quick story that it's kind of funny. I was a young man just out of college and traveling with a software company the first time. And I had to go up to Minneapolis for about four or five days. And at that time, I mean, this is pre-internet, okay? So Mm -hmm. I used to have this habit that uh, a mentor of mine told me to do when you get into town. I'd go in the hotel room and I would open the the phone book and just kind of look through the phone book because it would tell you a lot about the area. Well, up in Minneapolis, in the first pages of the phone book, I mean, again, this dates me because when's the last time you've seen a yellow pages in a hotel room? And the one in the first pages that I opened up, there's a map for the um, walkway system in downtown Minneapolis. So they have a walkway system that connects the buildings because it's too stinking cold to walk outside. And so I decided at that point in time, Minneapolis was not a place I wanted to live. If you had to have a walkway system and there was a map for the walkway system (laughs) to get around town in downtown Minneapolis. Okay, so uh, thanks for humoring me on my silly story. How does one figure out the complexity of a, um, or the advanced, what are you going to say, the state of the public transportation systems? Now, I know we have advantages of the internet, but, you know, I'm not even sure where I would start looking. The internet is great. You would actually be surprised. I'm always surprised by the amount of YouTube videos teaching people how to do anything. Um, And I have a great breakdown on my site about specifically using the metro in Europe and how to use that. But the general rule is the bigger the city, the more developed that public transit will be and the less developed and the more rural you get. So if we're talking South America, um, places like that, that's where you're having kind of buses showing up, not showing up, getting to weird places, lack of communication versus the high efficiency you see in the Mm -hmm. busy busy cities. Um, but, but looking online is a really good resource to do that. Watching videos, I feel like for a lot of people is very helpful because you can actually see how do you put the ticket into the thing? How do you buy a ticket? Nice. How do you know how to open the doors? Sometimes if you're not used to the big city transit, how do you even open the doors on the subway if they don't open automatically for you? Mm-hmm. Things like that. And then you would be surprised when you travel too, how if you come across as friendly to the locals, how much they are willing to help you. Even notoriously cranky New Yorkers and Parisians, if you just kindly say, hey, I don't know how to open these doors or which tube to take, then they'll usually really help and direct you as long as they're not running to work. Okay, so let's dial back. I'm thinking back to the days that your mom first found the how to hack all this stuff. Where is one of the most exotic and crazy places you went, like almost out of the gate? Mm, let's see. I do remember going... Um, on a Christmas vacation to Mexico, it was amazing. We stayed in this top penthouse suite, but we took a day trip to this tiny little Mexican mountain town. And I remember uh, taking a series of buses and a connection of buses, um, these rickety little buses up into this mountain town to kind of go explore that. And that was an adventure in, in public transit for sure. A very, um, opening experience for a young 
person who had only lived in the United States and mm-hmm. not been exposed to things like that. That was a that was a pretty cool experience. There, there's some kids that let us ride their donkeys up at the top, and we got a slice of banana cream pie and adventure way back down. Oh, fun. Okay, so now as a um, an adult married, where is the, one of the funnest places you've been with your husband and, and little one? My favorite place, Rex, is cliche because it's Paris. Okay. And it, it's always been Paris. We always keep coming back to that. Um, my husband would probably say Amsterdam. Okay. It's just- place that he's been. Um, one of the things that we try to do is we try to have, like I say, I feel like there's a a lot to be said for an authentic experience. And that can mean a lot to a lot of different people, what an authentic experience is for us. It's trying to kind of almost live as the locals would live a little bit. So we're living in an apartment through Airbnb sort of thing. We're taking public transit. We're going to the local bakery every morning to get our breakfast and we're spending a longer time in those locations. So instead of country hopping, trying to hit as many countries as we can. We usually try to stay one time in a city and really enjoy it. Uh, and that's something we really, really loved about Paris. Both of us did. In Amsterdam, we rented bikes and biked everywhere to get to where we need to go, like the locals did. And we had a really, really great time doing that. And I think uh, we always go to church in the local location we're going at. So we make some amazing contacts there. And we always... Uh, go to local parks with our toddler. We meet other parents there. We have really cool experiences, just kind of slowing down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, But we love adventure travel too. (laughs) Okay. So I was uh, thinking about that as you were answering. Uh, Where's the most rustic place you've gone? Oh, rustic. I don't think we've quite gone as rustic as some people think, like camping in the jungle or anything like that. That would be a very cool vacation to have. Would definitely be something I'd put on my bucket list and make happen. Um, let's see. There was a, another time in Mexico that I can think of that we stayed up kind of in a, another mountain town that we said we had to hike hills and hills and hills to get up to. You were in the middle of nowhere and it was a really cool little isolated place. Cool. Um, do you have a crazy story of, of uh, drama that's happened on any of your trips or have they all been miraculous Uh, easy trips. Oh, no, (laughs) definitely not. Definitely not. Um, One of the worst travel experiences we've ever had was my sister and I, my sister-in-law and I decided to take my, uh, how old was he then? Um, A year, year and a half. My 18 month old son, just the three of us decided to fly to to Spain. And we spent uh, a few weeks in Barcelona. And while we were there, we got bed bugs. Oh, no. I don't know if you've ever had bed bugs, but they are a nightmare. And we had never had them before. So we thought we were just being bitten by mosquitoes for a few days. We didn't realize what it was until we woke up. The baby was covered. We were covered. Our stuff was completely contaminated. The hotel wouldn't help us out. Wouldn't offer a refund. Wouldn't get us a new room. It was a nightmare. Oh, my goodness. The hotel wouldn't help you out when it was there bed bug infested room yeah you don't always get the yeah if you're not staying at a marriott you don't always get marriott service sometimes okay (laughs) wow so are you do you travel just the twice a year now do you travel more frequently i mean i know with a little one you're you kind of have some time constraints but uh you know you you said you get to europe twice a year Mm -hmm. okay other places you are you're going or is that your big ones for the year We don't always exclusively go to Europe. I'd say that's just kind of where um, we happen to like to go a lot. Okay. Um, We've not traveled extensively through Asia, which is on our list that we would like to go to. Right. What's interesting is we have, my husband and I have a very different viewpoint on travel. So I'm more of the adventurous, want to go anywhere, have any adventure we can, any experience, any language, I'm up for it. Right. My husband um, grew up in a family that didn't really travel. Their traveling really was going to see grandparents in a different state. And, uh, and the idea of international travel at first really made him nervous. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people feel that dynamic with their families, that one of them feels a lot differently towards travel than another one does. And making that mesh can be difficult. Okay. So we've been taking baby steps with him. Okay. So if you start at more familiar places with people that are uncomfortable uncom- with travel and then move outwards, I was telling him just the other day, I, we were talking about 
how we had canceled the trip to Thailand um, during COVID. And I said, I think it's funny that 10 years ago, you would have never gone there. You wouldn't have even entertained the thought because you would have been too scared. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be much too nervous to go to a place where the culture was so completely different. But because he's gone, you know, to England, which is a great new country to go to for Americans um, that haven't traveled internationally before. You know, he's been to Mexico. They love to cater to Americans if your resort's there. And so that's a great one. You know, he's been to several places now the idea of it isn't as frightening to him anymore. Yeah, I know. There are a lot of people who are, you know, I, it's kind of like what we've seen in the, the whole COVID thing. I'm not going to get political on this, but people's adherence to the mandates and what's been going on is a, has a lot to do with their assessment of risk, and what their, mm-hmm. what their yes. exposure to risk is. And so, you know, if you're a lumberjack and you run a chainsaw every day, COVID might look like nothing, you know, you're not going to, you know, cut your leg off with it kind of thing. And so, but if you're an office worker and you don't get out and this might be your first uh, uh, facing some, some drama or some, some life threatening situations, your level of risk intolerance might be completely different. Absolutely. Yeah. I would agree with you. London is a great, you know, the UK is a great place to start because it's, you know, a lot like the United States, except they don't give you ice cubes in your ice water. So, um, or they give you bubbling water instead of regular water. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget on that trip we were over there in London and you'd ask for a uh, glass of ice water and they would bring you a glass that had one cube in it. <laughs> and we like, had this experience. We asked for water and they'll bring us a, almost a shot glass full of water. Yeah. Can I more? <laughs> yeah. You know, no, I don't drink alcohol for all my meals and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when you're when you're putting together these trips, how far in advance? I mean, I, do you have to be ready to go sort of at a moment's notice, or how far in advance um, through your st- strategies and shopping does do the do you put these trips together? That's a really good question because I think a lot of people think to take advantage of really good deals and offers when they come up. I have to just go. I have to go right away. And that's not necessarily true. My husband has the type of job where we have to plan in advance if he's going to be coming on vacation with us, okay. um, you know, months in advance. I have the kind of job, I'm, I'm a nurse also okay. full-time. And because of that, I can kind of arrange my schedule and I can go a little more last minute if I just want to go somewhere with our, with our kids. Um, and so it really varies necessarily. You really can have it either way. It's kind of those have your cake and eat it too. You really can do it either way. You don't have to do it short-term travel. You don't have to do it far out travel. Either way can be cheap or expensive depending on how you're looking for those flights and how looking for those lodging places to stay. Okay. Uh, What's the most exotic food you've had during your travels? The first one that comes to mind um, was in the Bahamas. They eat what's called sea snail or conch. Mm-hmm. And so it's the beautiful shell you think of that they, yep. you know, they blow the sound out of, they call, and you eat the snail inside and it's delicious. <laughs> if you're a seafood fan, right. it tastes like a buttery lobster and they do it almost like a ceviche in a salad. It's delicious. Wow. By when I was just out of college, well, not quite out of college, I was working on my advanced degree and I had a degree in geography and spent a month in South America, primarily in Brazil and stuff. And so I had monkey uh, up in the, um, oh. about 1500 miles up the Amazon, about 500 miles up from Manaus. And uh, they didn't tell us what it was until afterwards. And so that was probably the most exotic thing I've ever had was some uh, little monkey with some grilled You're monkey. Not usually quite an adventurous eater. Uh, no, I would say I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> I just... There's certain things I'll eat it if you don't have to show me how you killed it and how you prepped it, right? I mean, it's like the old adage, you know, everybody loves sausage. Nobody wants to see it being made. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And I'm, I'm okay. I'll usually try. I don't, I'm not a picky eater to be um, on the most, most of the time, but. Anyway, We're quite no. foodies. If, if it sounds exotic and crazy, we'll probably try it. Well, then good for you. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> So how long have you been, um, you yourself, uh, been doing this, you know, this crazy business of helping people find travel for any budget? So that is something that really developed in the past, uh, I'd say maybe three years. Okay. Um, We had gotten back from our, well, it must have been just under three years now because we had our six-month-old son. We went to Paris with my parents um, 
and came back and we made $2,000 off that trip. After paying for all our expenses for the trip, we came in the positive $2,000. And uh, of course we felt like awesome, but it wasn't totally unusual for us to make money traveling. That's probably the most money we've ever made traveling. Right. Um, but f- free vacations are something that you can get used to if you do these sorts of tricks. Right. Um, so we made $2,000. We got back. I mentioned it to a few friends and it just blew everyone's minds. How did you do that? How did you make money traveling? That sounds like the dream. And then I started to teach people. And from that, I made my blog to start teaching people tricks on how to get those cheap flights, how to make money traveling, how to take a toddler (laughs) to another country, all the steps you need to do to make those sorts of dreams happen. And from there, I realized vacations are very personal to people, right? Like we were talking about our food experiences are so different, but what we expect in a vacation is so different. Um, you know, you were saying that you love traveling with your kids, but you guys are kind of paying this other stage in life without kids. So your travel looks different than me with toddlers and babies. Mm -hmm. And so it almost has to be a customized experience. So everybody feels like this is my dream vacation the way I want it. So working on -on one-on-one with clients has been amazing, helping them develop dream vacations completely in their budget. Okay. So now you've got my ears pierced. And I I think I remember this when looking at uh, reaching out to get you in touch. How in the world are you making money off of a vacation? How are you coming home with a profit in your pocket? Mm -hmm. So one of the big tricks for that is, first of all, you have to get that vacation for cheap, right? Because any way you make money traveling, it's going to, the money you spend takes away from that. So if you can start making the vacation cheap or within a budget, I don't like, like I said, I don't like saying cheap because I think it has a a connotation to it a little bit. Sure. Um, But if you can get it for a lower price then any money you make, you come even more on top for that vacation. Um, we ended up bumping flights. So we ended up um, volunteering to spend an extra night um, in New York. We had landed in New York. I think our flight was supposed to leave at 8 p.m. And we ended up leaving at 10 a.m. the next morning. So they, so they, up, so they gave you vouchers. So that mm-hmm. contributed. Okay. Yep. So we ended up copying our, uh, our room that night. And uh, certain airlines, if people realize, they make more money by overselling flights and yep. expect people not to show up then they would just selling 50 seats on the plane. We're going to sell 50 seats and cut it off. They routinely oversell flights. And because of that, this flight was severely oversold and they offered us uh, $1,500, 17, $1,700 each to Ooh. bump our flight. Wow. For a few hours and then leave the next morning. Wow. That that's great. That we always plan in. We had an extra day at the end of our trip, just in case that were to happen. I mean, best case scenario, you get home and you have an extra day to kind of unwind yeah. or to bump that flight. And because of that, we were able to make money just in Visa gift cards. So not in vouchers and Visa gift cards. Oh, wow. They paid you in Visa gift cards. Yep. That's something you can ask a lot when bumping flights. There's an art to bumping flights. Okay. Kind of get more, to, get more bang for your buck. <laughs> wow. That's an interesting, I'd never known that. And I, now I haven't tro- traveled ex- ex- extensively now. I used to spend about 75% of my time traveling for business. Mm -hmm. And most years I'd make 120 to 170 flights a year kind of thing. So it it was a lot of really boring travel. It's not the kind of fun travel. It's the kind of travel Mm -hmm. where three, four days into a trip, you wake up at a hotel and you don't know, you have that whoa moment where I don't know where I am kind of thing. Um, But wow, that's interesting. I had no idea. And I, you know, I would always, if I had flexibility, on the, on the going home leg, I would accept a bump because yeah, why not? Why not get a free ticket? Of course. Yeah. Or, you know, a voucher towards another ticket, but I never realized you could even ask for visa cards and stuff. Absolutely. And I think uh, what people don't realize is by far, and this is, this is a little different currently, but it will change again. The most travelers are business travels. Yes. Yes. In the entire travel industry, most people that are getting on airplanes and going places are going because company is rolling the pocketbook. Yep. And so because of that, these people, they need to get to their meetings in point A and they just want to get back home to point right. you know, to get back home. And, um, and so because of that, they aren't necessarily willing to bump flights because they just need to get from point A to point E. If they're not paying for it anyways, they just want to get home. So because of that, if you're in an opportunity 
and just ask, when's the next flight can I take? Sometimes it's within a few hours even. Right. And then you, you know, end up with uh, some cash in your pocket. Yeah. And I can tell you this, just from my perspective, I would leave on a Sunday night frequently or, or Monday morning. I wouldn't get home till Thursday or Friday, sometimes even Saturday morning, but I couldn't get bumped because I had three, three cities to go to. Mm-hmm. So it's not like I could just say, well, I'll, I'll miss all my appointments tomorrow. Uh, so, you know, no, I had to get to the location. And, and by that point, you miss your family. You just want to get home. Yeah. Well, and I wouldn't have accepted a bump during the week just because of my schedule wouldn't permit it. But sure. I would, but I would take a bump going home if, you know, there, but most of the time when I was single, I was, I mean, when I was traveling that heavy, I was single or I, you know, only had one or two kids and it wasn't a big deal if I didn't show up to the next day kind of thing. So anyway, hmm, I didn't realize that. So um, again, tell us where your blog and your website is so people can come and uh, learn a lot from you because it sounds like you've got a ton of tips to share. I do. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of general tips or things you look for, you can go to tripfixers.com. Okay. So that's tripfixers.com. F-I-X-E-R-S. Yep. Tripfixers.com. That's okay. my main blog. You can also find me on Instagram at trip underscore fixers. Okay. And I post a lot of tips and things like that on Instagram. Um, but if you want to work with me one-on-one, my average client saves about $2,000 their first trip alone. Wow. Um, and you can go that through my blog, just click on get cheap travel coaching or travel coaching or something like that. And I'll take you to the steps and, and we can even meet, you know, the first time, uh, and just talk about dream vacations and what your dream vacation looks like. And can I make this happen for you? What kind of money can you save? How much easier can it be? Things like that and take some of the stress away. Now, when you're included in these services, do you sort of package up or tell people advice about, you know, traveling with toddlers or traveling with small children or, tra- you know, traveling with senior citizens or somebody who might be disabled or, or do you, have you gotten to that point yet or, what, or is it primarily just um, financial savings? That's a great question. No, it's completely mm-hmm. customized based on what this, this client needs. So I work a lot with young families that want to travel with little kids and have a lot of stress of how do I pack for little kids? How do I keep everything organized? Do I need to know what to bring? Um, we do a lot with family travel. I work a lot with big families because the more people you add in, you know, $500 tickets, two people versus $500 tickets, six people yeah. adds up quite a bit. Um, so helping them, they have lots of room to save money. And then I work a lot um, recently because I'm also a nurse. I am able to work with a few people that have children or themselves have disabilities Mm -hmm. and helping them find travel um, in ways that are going to be the best experience for them, safe travel for them and uh, kind of planning things ahead of time, kind of troubleshooting the things that may arise before they do. I can remember traveling with my kids when they were little. Uh, My, you know, I have um, my kids are five kids and they're about 10 years apart. So 18 to 24 months apart and just something as as simple as, Oh, did we bring any Dramamine? You know, when everybody's throwing up, (laughs) when everybody's throwing up or how to dress them when they're traveling. So that way we're, you know, they're appropriately dressed and things like that. So there's just a lot of little tips that when you're busy planning this vacation to, you know, some theme park or the beach or whatever, sometimes you don't think those things through. Where does nap time fit in with all this? There's, There's a lot to it. Yeah. Do your kids carry their own luggage or do you all that? I can remember we went to Disney world one time and had all five of my kids there and they're pretty small and uh, we're pulling the the baggage off the baggage, you know, uh, the claim for out of claim, but baggage. Ooh, if I could talk off a baggage claim, claim, yeah, (laughs) carousel. And I took it all out to the curb so I could then go get the van for it. And I came back and I was almost embarrassed because there's this mountain. I mean, it was like a mountain of, of bags. I'm like, mm-hmm. whoa, <laughs> I couldn't have just, you know, I couldn't have drug all of them through over to the rental car. That would have been a disaster. So anyway, they're just little things like that you don't think through. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, especially with young kids, think, oh, I'll, I'll pack everything. I'll pack yeah. everything I need just in case. And it actually becomes so overwhelming. And most people find they don't even touch two thirds of their suitcase yeah. when they travel. Yeah. You can take a very minimalistic approach with, with kids if you're smart about it. So. We actually only travel um, with one backpack for me and a diaper bag when we travel, even if we're gone for weeks on end. We'll find a laundromat and do laundry there or get, um, if we need any things in the drugstore from diapers, things like that, we'll get it there yep. uh, because it makes it so much more manageable to hop on a Vespa or hop on a bus when not carrying bags oh, and bags of baggage. 
Well, you've been a fantastic guest today. I think you've uh, perked a lot of interest from our listeners, people who, you know, especially I'm, I'm going to be calling you, getting in touch with you because uh, you could save $2,000 on a trip when, you know, and especially where I'm in a situation coming up to be an empty nester, boy, travel as fast as I can. And, and, you know, saving that kind of money, you know, everybody likes to travel when you can do it then that far. And then I also know a lot of people who would just do it because they're getting a deal. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Right. And I think a huge part is we talked about the beginning of feeling like it's for other people or it's for a different time in my life. And the kind of nursing I do, I'm a cancer nurse. Okay. And I think uh, personally, I've seen that so much now of let's wait for retirement. Let's wait till we get the stage of life. Let's wait, let's wait, let's wait. And the truth is for a lot of people that time runs out yep. and that's very heartbreaking. And I don't mean that in a, in a cheesy way, but, but if you have these dreams to travel, if you want to experience other cultures and have these amazing connections with other people, you can't wait, you have no. to act. Well, what's interesting and what I find interesting about talking with you today is there's always a better way to do something. There's always a different way to do things. And if, if we just accept life as the, you know, mail it in, this is what everybody does. Um, there's an element of probably even adventure in trying to figure all this out. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. All right. So one last time before we uh, check out for today, can you please give your blog information out on your website? So that way I, our listeners know how to get a hold of you. Absolutely. So my web blog is tripfixers.com, T-R-I-P-F-I-X-E-R-S.com. I'll also send you a link that's special special for your listeners. Any of the resources I talked about while we were here, um, I'll put there and uh, and that way they can get a hold of me. We can get in contact if they would like help with cheap travel coaching or if they just want tips or just want to email me some questions and ask a few questions that they have. I'm happy to answer anything. Well, that's been great. And you are quite the sport. And thank you for coming on to uh, the show today. I'm excited to post this one up and get it out to people because uh, you have a lot of in- very valuable information. All right. So thanks a ton, Kelly. Uh, for those listening in, pay attention to the next podcast. Look for those subscription notifications. And until next time, this has been the Rex Andrew Show. You can always get the podcast on our website at rexandrew.com, excuse me, rexandrewshow.com. And then of course, listen to your podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, this has been Rex Andrew. Thanks and make it a great day.